السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him upon all conditions We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household all his companions without exception. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and to grant us goodness in this beautiful month of Ramadan. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, sometimes the rules and regulations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down are not understood by us. Sometimes they are not understood by a few of us. It is important that we ask in order to understand. And even if we don't understand, it's our duty as believers to adopt the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, people ask a question. When a woman is divorced or when she has lost her spouse through death, she has become a widow. In that particular case, or in both those cases, she has to spend a period of time known as the idda indoors or within her own property or her home. Now, some people ask questions and they begin to say, why is this rule and regulation there? The truth is, it is there in order to protect you, in order to save yourselves from rumor, from various other issues and problems. There is a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 234 makes mention of a woman who has lost her husband through death. She has become a widow. Allah says, those from amongst you who have passed away leaving behind wives those wives should spend a period of idda in meaning alone four months and ten days now the question is why that's a question obviously we may not know a lot of the reasoning before people used to say it's to ensure that the woman is not expecting, she hasn't conceived, she's not pregnant and various other reasons. But let me explain when you've lost your husband and you're so excited, you come out of the home, you're dressed up, you have perfume on and all this jewelry and so on. I'm sure people might start doubting. There might be a rumor. Was she involved somehow in this man's death? So to save you from that, Allah says, spend a period of time thinking, pondering. It is not a prison sentence. You don't have to be within one room. You don't have to be indoors in the sense that if you have a property, you're allowed to come out and for necessity, you're allowed to leave the home. You might ask, what is that necessity? That necessity is determined by you. If you think it is absolutely necessary for me to leave the home right now, then you leave that home and come back as soon as you can on condition that you're not going out to socialize, to have a laugh, to go out perhaps for something that is just going to be chit chat and so on because it will give you a time to ponder, to reflect, to collect yourself, to realize that there is something coming ahead. I'm going to be living now without this husband of mine who's been there for so long. And thereafter you come out, you emerge from this four month and 10 day period, a person who is already guided, a person who has some form of a plan. You now know where you want to be, what you want to do and so on. For those who have jobs, for example, and they are the breadwinners of the home, they might lose their jobs if they leave that particular job for four months and for four months and ten days. The scholars have given permissibility to go out if necessary, even to work. For medical reasons, you can leave. If you are the only person, say for example, who can take the school, the, the children to school, for example, and in some countries nobody else can do that for you, you are permitted to leave because that is a necessity. But where it is unnecessary, you, you should remain indoors. Like I said, you will be protected from rumor. You will be protected from people's comments, 
from people saying things, the worst feeling is you're trying to deal with the death of your husband and people are accusing you of involvement in his death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. Remember, never utter words that are hurtful. And at the same time, never give people reason to utter words that are hurtful. So my brothers and sisters, it is in order to save yourself from all of this type of statement and or this type of situation. Some people, when they are on that low, the period is a very low period in terms of emotions and so on. You find predators who come in and say soothing, cool words and on the rebound, as it were, we tend to fall in love, but it's not falling in love. We want to marry immediately without realizing this is wrong. If you give your time, if you give yourself that time, you will come to understand. You will be able to look clearly. You will be able to study and so on. So there are many points of benefit for this beautiful ruling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think the difficulty today is we've made it out as though it is a prison sentence for this female. And that is why a lot of the women tend to argue and they tend to debate. What is this idda all about? My beloved sisters, remember if Allah has ordained something, if Allah has prescribed something, it can only be the best for you, especially in this case, clearly mentioned in the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. May Allah protect our widows. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to marry those who are widows. Many of us, when we want to marry, we look for the youngest and the best of the lot, not realizing that there is great reward in looking at those who are widows, perhaps. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us all. Now we move on to the way to give charities. Sometimes when we have a collection of funds, say for example, a fundraising uh, event or people are collecting funds for a good cause, you have people who don't want to raise their hands because they claim that if I raise my hands, I am perhaps showing off. I want to give a thousand dollars, a hundred dollars, 10 pounds, 50 pounds. Maybe I'm too shy because the amount is too small or it might seem like I'm being arrogant because the amount is large. So people don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that it's better for you to conceal your charities. But if you have to make it known for the right reasons, there is no harm. It's correct. It's still acceptable. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of the charities were given and they were made known. People came in front of all the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and put forth their wealth. So this wealth was extremely, meaning in, in figures, it was a lot in some cases. It was needed. And at the same time, it was an encouragement for those seated. Imagine you see a poor person putting up his hand and donating a large amount. And you know that you have more than him. It should encourage you to say, no, if he can give, let me give a little bit more. So if you are doing it for the purposes of encouraging others, it is permissible. It is okay. It is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. But if you are doing it in order to show off, it is better that you remain silent. It is better that you do it quietly. Also, if there is no need to show it, then don't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it quite clear. Verse number 271 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, if you are to make manifest your charities, it's okay, it's good. But if you are to hide them and give them quietly to the poor, then it is better for you. It is definitely better for you. It will result in the forgiveness of your sins. So when we give charities, one of the benefits is Allah forgives our sins. Subhanallah. Yukaffiru ankum min sayyatikum. Allah will expiate, meaning Allah will cancel the sins that you have committed as a result of you being charitable. Imagine every day we're speaking of charities as well. How important it is to give. Let us learn to give even if it means a little. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says he is the one who knows your intention. So when you give, then he knows why you are giving. Try and be a person who gives for the right reasons. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also explains in the next verses, Allah says, those who are really in need, those who are poor and they are really in need, you will have to go out to hunt for them. They don't beg, they don't ask, they don't come and seek. You will have to find out. An effort is required from you as well because those who come and beg, you know, they have come to beg. Those who are in dire need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will have to go out to hunt for them. In fact, Allah says the ignorant person might consider them wealthy because they restrain themselves from asking. So when you look at a person, you might think this man is wealthy. You don't know he is struggling to make ends meet, but his honor and his dignity does not allow him to go out and beg. He knows I'm a mu'min, I'm a Muslim, I have hands, I have legs. Let me go out, try and work. Perhaps I'll try and make ends meet. Remember my brothers and sisters, those are the types of people that we need to assist first. They don't go out. We should be going to them. So Allah says, verse number 273, Surah Al-Baqarah. An ignorant person would probably consider these people wealthy because of the person restraining himself from asking and from begging and this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says verse number 274 of surah al-baqarah <laughs> Those who spend their wealth at night and at daytime, openly and hidden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will have their reward with Allah and they need not fear. They will not be scared at all. They need not be scared and they need not be fearful. Allah will protect them. Allah will look after them in this world and the next. Imagine this is all the virtue of giving, being charitable. The primary reason for this is our hearts are supposed to be connected to Allah, not to materialistic items. The more you connect yourself to materialistic items, the more you disconnect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, everyone wants wealth. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters do not want it in a way that it comes in the path between you and Allah. So you have to choose my money or Allah. No way. It is always only Allah. Then we will earn in order to live our lives. Remember that a lot of what you have, you are never going to be able to spend it. Learn to be charitable. Let others spend it. Imagine you earned and you're giving another person the opportunity to spend what you earned. That is what the reward is. That is why Allah loves you. Because Allah knows you sweated, you worked hard and you have such a great heart. You have given it to someone else to spend. Amazing. So Allah says, hang on, we will forgive your sins as a result. We will ensure that you are not scared on the day of judgment. We will ensure that you have no reason to be fearful on that particular day, nor to be sad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. That having been said, we know there are a lot of poor people around and we know that times are tough and we know that in the economy of every nation, there will always be a dip. And during that time, people will be tested. Those who have wealth, they will want to make money somehow. They will want to increase their wealth. And sometimes a quick way is a haram way. So Allah warns us, save yourselves from sickness, from harm, save yourselves from the loss of the hereafter. While you are looking for wealth, don't do something haram. One of those things that Allah has spoken about that is absolutely prohibited is something known as riba. Riba meaning interest or usury. It is the dirtiest, filthiest wealth that one could have. As much as it seems like, wow, this looks like, you know, figures from 10, it became a hundred from a hundred. It became a thousand. There is no blessing in that wealth, no baraka at all. You will have it. You will eat it. It will result in sickness, physical and spiritual, and it will result in discord, disunity, problems in the home, difficulties in your family, 
your children don't obey you because you haven't obeyed Allah. Many sicknesses and illnesses that we have, problems that we face are connected with the fact that our income is faulty. It's faulty. It's better to have less and have a happy home and be close to Allah than to have a lot and be distant from everyone, be sick inside and out, meaning spiritually as well as externally. We are ill physically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. Listen to the strong words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses when it comes to riba. Allah says, verse number 275 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Those who consume riba on the day of judgment, they will not be able to stand except like the one who has been touched by the devil, possessed by the devil or harmed by the devil or beaten up by the devil. They will not be able to even think correctly on that day because whatever they have done, all of it happens to be in the displeasure of Allah in terms of the sustenance that they earned. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Some of the Mufassireen have actually said that even in this world, a person who eats interest, their brains become knocked at a time when you will talk to them and they will be responding, but they don't make sense. They don't understand. Everything they utter will be wrong. It will be incorrect. Yet they will be thinking we are right. Imagine it's as though they are possessed, completely possessed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this. What would be the purpose of wealth if the consumption of that wealth would result in us being semi-possessed by the devil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all. In fact, Allah says in verse number 279, after he tells us to quit eating interest, to quit the consumption of this interest, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says quite clearly, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ if you are not going to quit the consumption of interest, then let there be an announcement of war against you from Allah and his messenger. Subhanallah. Allah is announcing war against those who are consuming interest. When Allah announces war, your life will be turned upside down completely after a period of time. You cannot win a war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't even try. This is why Allah says, If you seek forgiveness for you is the capital that you put in. If you ask Allah's forgiveness, you need to make sure you extract the amount of interest from the amount you are holding such that your capital remains with you. This is why whenever you have an amount of interest sometimes because you might you may be banking with a bank that gives interest and it's illegal not to bank and so on so if you really have to and there is an amount of interest you need to calculate it it is your duty to remove it and give it to poor muslims without any any intention of reward for that particular wealth but rather a reward for having done the right thing there is a difference here so people say well why can't i give it to non-muslims Technically speaking, you could, but the Muslims are more in need of that wealth. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to someone else. You don't know who it is. You are giving it as a charity on behalf of someone else whom you don't even know. And to give it to a Muslim would be better because they are in need. So look for the poor Muslimin, give them in cash or in kind. And your intention is not for a reward for that wealth, but obviously you will get a reward for having taken it out of that particular system of yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. So if we were to consume interest, we would be harming ourselves. That, would, that means if we don't consume it for the sake of Allah, we are saving ourselves. Hence, this verse is included in this series known as save yourselves. You save yourselves by protecting your income ensuring that there is no haram element inside that particular income of yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a deep understanding. Indeed, we will never be able to win a battle against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then 
something we all need to be concerned about. You know, the last verses of the Quran to be revealed were not the end verses, not Surah Al-Nas, Min Al-Jinnati Wa Nas. That happens to be the last in terms of the sequence of the order of the Quran, but not in Revelation. In Revelation, the Mufassirin and the historians and the Ulama and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, there are various narrations which make mention of several verses. One of them is verse number 281 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Some of the scholars say that was the last verse to be revealed. Do you want to know what it says? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fear the day in which you are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear the day of return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you will definitely be given all your, the details of your deeds. Everyone will see the result of their deeds and nobody will be oppressed. So save yourselves from the torment of the hereafter by being conscious of the fact that there is a day in which I will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything I have done. No matter what you've done in your life, Allah knows it and you will be asked about it. There is only one way out. What is that way? That way is the way of tawbah, repentance. Allah says, no problem, no harm. You are not proud of some of the things you've done in your life. Okay, delete them. How do you delete them? You need to admit to us that you did something wrong. You need to regret it. You need to seek forgiveness from us and you need to promise you won't do it again. Once you fulfill these four qualities or these four characteristics, you or conditions, you will be forgiven completely. We won't even ask you about it in most cases. We won't even ask you. It's deleted, gone, and it's even forgotten by the angels. So this is why my brothers and sisters, be conscious of what you have prepared for tomorrow to present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person comes to you, to your home, and mashallah, they bring a gift for you, you are happy. You will invite them again. They brought a beautiful gift for you and they came. You're happy. When we go to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are we going to take? Are we going to take all the evil deeds that we've done every single day? Are there no good deeds that we would like to do so that we can present them to Allah? He doesn't need material items. In fact, he doesn't even need these deeds. But if we present them to him, he will grant us Jannatul Firdaus. We will be the ones who will be saved from the fire. When, when we've presented deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've shown him that, oh Allah, I was weak. I was human. But I tried my best to please you. Where I faltered, I turned back to you as quickly as possible. Oh Allah, this is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, extremely important point. Let's become conscious of this. I mean, then we move on to saving ourselves from discord when it comes to business, when it comes to money matters. How do we do that? The longest verse in the Quran is verse number 282 of Surah Al-Baqarah. The longest verse. It's known as Ayatul Mudayana. It's known as the verse which has recorded what should be done when a person takes or gives debt or credit. This is something absolutely important. It's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is telling us when you contract a debt for a specified term, make sure you write it down. The weakness with us, we don't write things down. It's between yourself and your son, yourself and your father, yourself and your brothers. And you don't write it. You started a business and you think to yourself, you know what? We friends, we family, nothing will go wrong. That is not correct. Allah says, save yourselves from the tension and the stress and the discord and the disunity and the split that will happen in your home if you don't write all of this by writing it down. Make sure you write it no matter what. Imagine even if you are about to die or you are on a journey 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, write things down, important matters. Get a few witnesses. Let them sign or let them bear witness. Subhanallah, many of us are guilty of not doing this. So many business transactions, so many things we want to be done, but they are not written down. Write them down. It's a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, it is an instruction from Allah. Listen to what Allah says in that beautiful long verse. I'm only going to read a short part of it. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu idha tadayantum bidaynin ila ajalim musamma faktubuhu O oh, you who believe, if you have contracted a debt for a specified term, make sure you write it down. Subhanallah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and bring witnesses to bear witness as to what has happened. The transaction, I owe this man so much. Please bear witness. Or this man owes me so much. Please bear witness. This is something absolutely important. My brothers and sisters, many of us take this for granted. I have come across so many cases in my own life where the father passes away. The children are in business with the father. Nothing is written down and the brothers are fighting. The one says, I did more than you. Mine is more. Or one says, I was in the business while you were not in the business. So I own more. And trust me, they stop talking to each other. They begin to hate each other. They suffer so much of discord just because it was the father's fault. He didn't write things down. Subhanallah. Very simple. Tell them, look, yours is 10%. Yours is 10%. Mine is 50%. Your mother's is so much. Your sister's is so much. And whatever else you want. Give them a share of your business. Make sure you've written it down. Make sure you know. Here, we're not speaking about inheritance. We are speaking about writing things down when you are dealing, when something has happened, when there is a partnership, any transaction of importance, make sure it is written. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually revealed this in the longest verse in the Quran. Go out and read it. In fact, I ask you all to go tonight and to read that verse, verse number 282 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And read 283 and 284 as well. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Something very, very interesting. Let's move on to the last thing tonight. Where, as we've been saying, we call out to Allah. We supplicate. We are supposed to be asking Allah so many things. We are supposed to be constantly asking Allah. Imagine if Allah tells you to call out to Him using specific words. Don't you think those words are blessed? Don't you think those words are more valuable than your words and mine? Although I'm allowed to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using my own words in my own language. I can supplicate in any language. But imagine if you were to use words that were used by the prophets of Allah. May peace be upon them. Those words have already opened the doors of response. You're using the same key. Most probably the door is going to open because that's the key. The same wording, subhanallah. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of some beautiful du'as. You see, we are weak. We save ourselves from the punishment of Allah by asking Allah not to punish us. As simple as that. Ask Allah not to punish you. And if you are sincere, He won't punish you because that will be recorded. When your book is open on the Day of Judgment and the deeds are out, your statements are out, Allah will see that so many times you said, Oh Allah, don't punish me. Oh Allah, don't punish me. Oh Allah, please don't punish me. When he sees that he is Ghafoor rahim most merciful, most forgiving. Do you really think he's going to say, No, I'm ignoring this. I still want to punish you. We have hope in the mercy of Allah. My brothers and sisters, we have hope in the mercy of Allah. When we have asked him not to punish us, we hope that he will not punish us. Verse number 286, Surah Al-Baqarah. Rabbana... لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا. Oh Allah, do not hold against us our forgetfulness wherever we have forgotten or where we have made a mistake. Oh Allah, do not hold it against us. ربنا أو أو رب ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا. 
O oh Allah, do not burden, do not burden us with the burdens that you burdened those before us with. Subhanallah. We are asking Allah, oh Allah, don't put on our shoulders what you've already put on other people's shoulders that we've heard about. And then we are saying, Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bih. Oh, our Rabb, do not place on our shoulders burdens that will be too big for us. We won't be able to go through that. Oh Allah, protect us. Don't test us with tests that will be too difficult for us. Wa'fu anna and pardon us. Waghfir lana and forgive us. Warhamna and have mercy on us. Anta maulana, you are our protector. Fansurna ala al qawmil kafirin. So grant us victory over those who disbelieve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May He grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdihi. نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك